Hello there and welcome to this little arty corner on YouTube. My arty corner to be precise. I'm Angela, Angela Porter, and I'd love to welcome you here. In fact, not just love, but I really do welcome you here to this corner. And I thank you for joining me and I appreciate all the lovely comments and shares and thumbs up um, and subscriptions that you give me. Thank you. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. Can't say any more than that. Um, my apologies, firstly, for not answering comments. My attention span and ability to stay awake has been pretty poor again over the last week. But I'm getting there. I feel a lot more alert today after a very bizarre night because it turns out I couldn't get to sleep till five o'clock this morning. Gone five o'clock. And I was awake again soon after nine. And yet I feel full of energy. So goodness knows what's going on. So... <laughs> I just don't question it. I just go with the flow. It's far, far easier. So, OK, so this video is a kind of continuation of the last one. I say kind of because let me move that out the way. There is a reason I've put that there is this is where I left the last video. I think I, I think I did. I haven't done anything more to it. And I went away thinking, oh, just, oh, Angela, what were you thinking? Um, I wasn't happy with the ink tense blue spaces and the wrinkly paper. I wasn't happy with the blue pen that bled. Um, and I'm there going, Angela, when are you going to learn that colouring in big spaces with water-based media isn't your forte? And I know it's not. Um, but I woke up or... I was doing some work in my new Zibaldoni, I suppose you call it, my new pattern directory, pattern and tangle collection. I'm not quite sure what you call it, but motif collection, all kinds of things. I haven't worked out a proper name for it yet. And um, I realised that sometimes less colour is more, especially for me. So I did a couple of things done a couple of things in the last hour or so. One of them was to redraw that design, kind of. I'm never going to be able to replicate it exactly, but I redrew this on some marker paper and I've coloured those spaces in with alcohol markers and made a bit of a mess of it in places, but I'm not going to fret about it because this is really me trying out ideas. And instead of using a darkish colour pen, I chose a pen that kind of tones in with the black background, and it's this one. It's a Uni Emot, and it's an Everfine pen. They're called Everfine pens as well, and it's a 0.4 nib. So it's about a, equivalent to about a um, 03 micron, really. OK, and this particular one is colour 79, and it's kind of a greenish bluish greyish colour. I really like it. I like the muted colours in this. Now Dimwit here, that's me, forgot I had these as I've bought tons of fine liners. Just don't ask. My head is completely all over the place and um, well you know I do run out of supplies occasionally. It's just see all the pens I've got stockpiled here. It's ridiculous. The fear of not having anything. Oh, anyway, I'm not going into that. <laughs> but um, these, the ink in these is pigment based. It is waterproof when it's dry. Perfect for working with water soluble media. So it would have been perfect on this to begin with before I added colour on the top of. Yeah, welcome to my world. But I quite like this ghostly image. And what I did want to do, or what I do want to do, is I do want to add some highlights here. And I am going to use, and I'm going to do this briefly here, because I, I'm, in, I'm intrigued myself. I'm going to use a Derwent Colour Soft pencil. I ordered just white ones because I'm forever running out of these, because I do use them for blending colour quite a bit. And they should give just enough of a highlight here. Just to help pick out the edges of these 
spaces here near the crescent moons. I prefer this to the charcoal or whatever, especially on this paper. This is marker paper, it's Ohuhu marker paper. And so it's very smooth. The charcoal won't really get rubbed into the surface and it will just smudge. And I'm not quite sure how fixatives will react with alcohol markers. So this is another option. I could use a white jelly roll. I, I, I'm going to try this because I know I can put a white jelly roll on top if necessary. Or a, a souffle pen because souffle pens are much more opaque than jelly rolls. So I'm not going to do it all. Just enough to see if that makes a subtle difference. Sorry, my hand was in the way. But all I'm doing is going around the crescent moons here and just filling the outer edge, the lightest edge in with white or just going over the top just to brighten that colour a bit. Um, I had trouble finding the right set of Ohuhu markers. I wanted the brush markers because I knew I had large areas to fill in. And um, yeah, just thought they would be better. Look, uh, angle my arm awkwardly. I am conscious that I can sometimes forget about the camera and people seeing my hands and so on. I try to remember, but I'm not always so good with it. So it is very subtle, but it is there. So, and I can add more shadows with um, pen with these pens as well. Now I'm looking for that. I don't want royal purple. I wanted the Prussian blue. Yeah, I've got Prussian blue here. So to add shadow, I'm just going to go around the outer edge. Just a little bit. And then what I will use is I've got a Derwent blender pencil. Now this is far nicer than other ones I've used. The other ones are very smooth. They, they do sort of blend the colour. This seems to have a bit of um, I'm going to say a grittiness, but it's a very fine grittiness, so it, it almost acts like extremely fine sandpaper almost, and picks the colour up and moves it, and it'll do the same with the white, so I can blend the edges of the white in. So that just adds that extra bit of shadow there. So that's something I'm going to consider with this one. Same here with the betweed, is that I can put some of this blue in the areas between them and just blend it out. And then as I'm doing this, I'm realizing that I could have done shading with pencils on top of the markers, that I didn't have to do the shading with markers because it has got very dark and very dense around the edge. High contrast, but I like that. So that was another option. And then I thought, okay, let's just do one that is just with coloured pen because there is something lovely about the simplicity of this and then with just simple shading afterwards there's a cohesiveness. I think there will be in the others but I'm not entirely sure. So I'm going to work on this one today because I will use some other filler patterns and before I do that Trying not to make this too long an introduction, but I am. This here is my A5 folder, and this is where I'm keeping all of my... Um, these stickers came with these folders, and these folders are all purples and blues. Purples, pinks and blues, and possibly there's green there. Greens. Bright orange and yellow. Crazy. So I've got a section that's officials and tangle patterns, which you can see here. I've got all of the ones I could find, um, including the new ones at the end. So I've got them as a reference. I started putting together my favourite tangle patterns um, from um, tanglepattern.com, but then I stopped for a bit. But I have made a note there of how far I got I was working on A's, so I'm going to carry on with that. And then I had a break and did borders, which I shared some of this with you. But this is now the complete page. You can see. Um, so I've done added some others. I haven't added the shading or anything because I'll get round to that when I'm up to it. Because I'm 
you know me i'm not a fan of doing it but there's another page here of ribbons and borders some of them are taken from full you know sort of like gridded patterns others from elsewhere some are mine i think not necessarily you know zentangle or czts or other people's um, some of them i may not know where they've come from they may be identical to other people's but they all kind of work together and then i've got a final page which i was working on um about five o'clock this morning yeah no bonkers i've got to try and keep myself awake now so that i go to bed at the usual time tonight and try and reset everything and then i started the next page as well i do like this one it does look like tentacles and then here this is what i got lost in yesterday was i was looking for filler and texture patterns and i had a look at rebecca blair's art for inspiration so a lot of these here taken from her plus some variations and different ways of doing it from me but they're all a jump off point a starting point i love her work and then i've got more here which are some are inspired by rebecca blair others by traditional texture patterns that artists use some are variations doodle filler patterns and so on and it's quite fun to collect things together and um, no doubt as i go through favorite tangle patterns i'll add more because there will be others that are really good as filler patterns but by filler patterns i mean ones where you can just fill a space with a pattern that um it's just interesting and nice you know it doesn't have to have a necessarily repeated kind of um you know structured way so i'm going to do that not with that pen because that is for over there this pen in some of these and i'm going to use some of these to fill these pattern oh gosh sorry I just whacked the camera yeah it's going to be one of them days i'm really really you know good about this so what i thought i'd do is i am going to use a pencil and i'm going to add some pencil lines in that create wavy borders or wavy ribbons here so i could use ribbon patterns which would be quite fun but i'm going to share with you some textural patterns and by making these lines all wobbly and wonky, we'll end up with a really interesting um, arrangement here. And I'm putting them there and I am going to put a border around the edge as well, because I don't particularly want these patterns to go right up to the black line. I want to leave a little gap there. So that's just a reminder for me. I'm going to try and keep that gap even right the way along, but it's just a reminder more than anything. So pattern I'm going to do here is going to be, let me have a look, I'm going to find, find the one I wanted to do, oh yeah, this one. I'm going to start here with a triangle and in centangle fashion, just going to round the corners. And I will zoom in for you and try and keep my hands out the way. And then next door, I'm just going to put another shape, leaving a small gap between them. And I'm going to round these corners again, just to add that little bit of ink in places. Do the same here, like so. And then perhaps another triangle shape. slanty rectangle and then here I'm just going to fill the space with whatever fits there which happens to be another triangle so that creates an interesting kind of way of splitting this ribbon or this area up I want to put something in the next one but I want something that's quite different to this one so for that I'm going to use just vertical lines but with these vertical lines I'm going to split them up somewhere around the middle 
for the dot. So I'm going to draw a part, put a dot, draw the rest of the line. If I was using a more flexible nib or one I, I wasn't wanting to um, necessarily, um, my, or don't necessarily mind wrecking, then I'd put a bit more pressure on at the beginning of the line. In fact, I would say that these pens, I actually seem to not wear out as quickly as I do. Ooh, two dots there. As I do Pigma Microns. These lines are beginning to curve and I'm fine with that. It's just what they want to do. And I, you know, I could have worked hard to keep them parallel. But when they curve, they kind of add a volume to this line. It suggests that this is bending upwards, perhaps. So we've got that one there. And I'm just going to put a little bit of one there. In fact, I think I can just probably put one there and then a little bit just there. But what I can do is I can just go back. I think if I keep my hand over here, you'll see my pen. And I'm trying hard to remember to hold my pen flatter than I normally would because I tend to write like this with pens. I'm very vertical. And this is very awkward for me. But I'm aware you like to see how my pen's moving, so I'm doing my best. It's very grey and wet here again today in Wales. It was yesterday. In fact, yesterday we had sunshine, showers, heavy rain, hailstorms, and sunshine with the hailstorms and everything else. It was bonkers. Like Mad March weather in April. So I was comfortably remaining at home yesterday and I will today. I do need to go out shopping at some point, but it can wait till tomorrow. I won't starve. That's for sure. Just have to remember to start cooking at a sensible time. That's part of my problem. The days run away with me and I forget. I forget to eat, you say? Yeah, because the medication, the antidepressants, actually suppress my appetite. So I, I, I don't feel hungry a lot of the time. And when I do eat, I don't want to eat very much. So there's that one. I do want something that perhaps is a little bit more geometric. Now I am going to turn this this way and I'll do my best to keep my hands out of the way of the pen. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to draw these shapes, but I'm going to not draw a complete zigzag, I'm drawing individual V-shapes in this kind of fashion. So I've got these here and I am going to turn them into triangles like this. And then I'm going to split them in half maybe, and just fill them with um, some kind of pattern. Perhaps this one I'll do this way. Must remember to add that to my book. And then this one I'll add this one too, just like this. This one perhaps I'll split this way and this side I'll fill with tiny little circles or roundish shapes. Dipple, I believe. Really tiny to give dense ink. And then this one right on the end I'll just fill in with brown because I can. In fact, I wouldn't mind putting some perhaps darker brown stripes on one side there, like that. Yep. 
So that is getting to be interesting. Now in true zentangle fashion, I am going to add shadow to the left. Well, I say zentangle fashion, this is angular fashion. I'm going to add ink to the left and bottom of these shapes. Like so. And we'll do some corner rounding inside as well. So that is just makes these feel complete and finished, or you know, purposeful in their way. So that's an interesting one. Now I've got quite a lot of ink in this section. In fact, here I may just have a look. Put some diagonal stripes here. Because I can, essentially. Like so. So there's quite a lot of ink going on there. Okie dokes. What about this one? With this one, I am going to do a zentangle pattern. And I'm going to do. I'm torn between Diva Dance and Mist. I think I might do Mist. Which is basically little lines that can be straight or wavy, a bit of weight at the end, but with drops coming off. And they vary in length and so on. It's very, I don't have a lot of space here to do this, but I'm happy to do what I can. It means that I do have quite a lot of ink at the top, but the bottom is much more light and airy. So I'm getting that variation of ink density and the interest that goes with it. Let's do with making that one just a bit longer. This one can go that little bit longer as well. Interesting as I get towards the edge here because I've got this awkward shape. So I think what I'll do is I'll start on this side and just start to bring these in. Let's make the tops a little bit wider than they have been. Makes that one a little bit shorter so I can just fit in the dots. So there we are, so we filled that one in as well. And then the bottom one here, I think this one I will do Diva Dance in. Diva Dance is one of my favourite patterns of all. And I am going to do it. in an interesting kind of way. So I've drawn a wobbly line and where these dip down from the pencil line, I'm just going to fill them in with some ink. Then I'm going to just pour of that and then I'm going to choose where I want to add some ink and I'm going to put some in the dips this time. So essentially I'm flattening this line to some degree. And then I can add ink to the inside of the humps on that side. I will just look this way. We've got some perhaps humps in the humps in, humps on the humps. Yeah. That's a little bit extra there. A little bit of extra ink on the end there. It's going to be interesting here because I've now hit the um, pencil line here. I can go actually a little bit lower, to be honest. I'm just going to add some ink in the dips, just to add some extra, to fill some space in with ink.
So here I'm just going to complete that one, I think. And I think this one I can also fill in with ink to complete the base of this one. And this one I'll add some ink towards the edge. But I also think I'm going to do something here that is imagining how I draw Diva Dance Fit Continued. Now here I've managed to make this one just that little bit longer than I wanted so I'm just going to adjust the lengths here so they all fall in line. So I've got that section filled with lots of different patterns and there's no reason why we shouldn't be able to do that. And it's, it's, it, it adds interest but it's also great for the sampler book, the entangled samplers because there's lots of um, examples of patterns you can use to fill a space. We choose another space. Okay, I'm going to do this one and again I'm just going to, well I don't have to leave a gap with this one I wanted to leave that gap here I'm not going to but I'm going to do a variation I suppose sort of crescent moonish but it's not. So I'm drawing a hump a bit like crescent moon going to leave a gap I'm going to draw another hump and I'm going to draw a hump from just a little bit on this one to the left of the middle and this one to the right of the middle no the other way around to the you know what I mean so I can leave a gap between them as well and draw the next series of them and I'm going to do the same where I'm going to leave that gap the top of the humps. Now there would be a hump there so let's be consistent and then here I need to draw the rest of the tops of the humps in going across. So I'll turn this around so you can see it. Sorry for not for getting my hand in the way. I am trying to remember I'm doing my very level best Now I could have put some pencil guidelines in here so that I keep the tops of these all even or I could have put wonky pencil guidelines in and had a more wonky pattern I suppose. It'd be fun. Now these are getting larger as I'm going up. I think it's because I'm drawing them on the side now rather than as I was. That's okay. Perhaps I'll play with this idea of them getting larger and smaller again. Because, um, again, that variation in size can add a lot of interest to a pattern. And it can add another rhythm to it if it's done deliberately, but randomly it can as well. Okay, so this will be the last. Series of these humps with the gaps between them. Those little gaps give this a very different kind of look and feel. Just a simple variation that we often don't think about. And there we go. And there would be perhaps just a bit of one there. So quite different. The sh this will come to life when I add shadow but I can also go and add line weight to the left of each of these shapes towards the ring appearing in the curve at the top. That one I didn't leave a gap for. It'll be fun. Nobody will really see it in the grand scheme of things hopefully. Just this little bit of extra ink will suddenly start to give this some volume, some dimension. And I will roughly keep the idea of shadow and highlight as being top and the left, oh, the, le the bottom and the left across the whole design. So it's consistent. Of course there's another way of keeping it consistent which is keeping it consistent within a particular pattern or motif or 
and regardless of the rest of the page, as long as you repeat what you're doing within similar items, you know. So say you've got three flowers on the page, all in different places. As long as you add the line weight the same way to each of them, then there's a consistency in them and how they appear. And then if you're using, say, Huggins in different places on the page, then as long as you add um, line density, shadow, highlight, whichever, consistently in all of those, then they will add a coherence. Even if it's a different way of adding that shadow to the flowers that you've got on the page, say, for example. So that instantly now has added some volume. I could go further and add like dots at the top, but I'm not going to for now. OK. All right, let's pick another section. Let's add some more patterns here. OK. All right, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add an interesting way of adding texture. And I guess it's a bit like Zentangle's Paradox, except it's not as all ordered as, um, yeah, organised as it is. So I've start, picked a corner to start in. I've started this corner, just started a certain distance out, it doesn't matter, and then I've drawn parallel lines going back. This corner, I'm going to draw diagonal lines going in a different direction. So then I'm going to go here, top, and just fill this in, patterns like this. You can actually create paradox in any shape if you use the, the, the ideas that there are in um, this kind of, uh, you know, in the way that paradox is written, even within the shape, because this shape is roughly triangular. It's just that the sides are curved, so you're going to have to follow those curves. Perhaps I'll choose another shape, perhaps this one, and do paradox in that. This is quite um, fun and interesting because I'm going to now add some these parallel lines going this way. And then we're going to connect this section down to this area, like so. And it's at a slightly different angle to that one, which is quite nice. Then I'm going to look here and we're going to connect this here. Then from here across to here. It's not as um, organised as paradox, but you end up with that kind of disappearing into the centre kind of feeling. It's a thunder shade. Oh, I'm, I was off the screen. I'm so sorry. I think I was off the screen. I hope not. I'll do that in another section. I'll do that in another section. How about that? So I'll do that one again here in this section and I'll zoom out so that I'm less likely to wander off screen. OK. So I'm starting this one by drawing a diagonal line across this corner and filling this in with parallel lines. Not breaking these lines, you could do. Not making the ends any thicker, but you could do. And then I'm going to add another line here. And then draw parallel lines to fill the space behind it towards the edge of the space, towards the corner there. 
then I'm going to look at the next place, I reckon I could get some parallel lines in here. I think I might add another one just there because then it looks like it's meant to be there. And then I want to draw a parallel line across here. This one is going to hit this one, so I want to make it an interesting angle that is different from others. So I'm going to go like this. Now I am not at all worried that I've got a gap here. So I know that as I work on this pattern, it's going to fill this space in. And this gap will get filled in, but in an interesting way. OK, so this is where I started. So I now want to draw um, some kind of lines. Here will be fine. And in this case, it's joining on to the other, you know, the fill that in this other corner. So we've now filled in a little bit more space. I can't really, well, I can actually put something that connects there and I can just add a few more lines here like so and perhaps a couple more and there and then I'm going to draw up to that corner from this line to this corner fill I should say then from here we're going to go across to here and I'm going to take some here and you don't have to start where the line ends I did there but here I'm not I'm starting a little bit further back in then I'm going to do the same kind of idea to fill this corner But rather than start where the line ends, is just draw things a little further back. It's kind of holly ish but you know you're tucking all everything underneath. I'm going to do the same thing here. It's like very wide planks in their own way and fashion, without leaving any empty space between them, I suppose. But this is. There's no, this always seems to work out no matter which way you go or how you work it. It's just that splitting up the space that you've got left and working towards a corner from that line you've drawn. So this one, I'll just fill that one in. So there you can see. I filled two in in pretty much the same kind of way. Yeah. I was going to do lots of different patterns on here, but obviously not because I'm a muppet with a camera. Okay, I said I was going to do paradox in one of these shapes, so let's choose this one to do paradox in. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to start in the corner and I'm going to water this down and spread the line out a little bit towards the end. This one's easy because it's a straight line. So we start from where that line ended and just then, you know, sort of like draw the line. It's a straight line. But so it, and it just makes a slightly bigger gap here. I've perhaps done that gap a little bit too big. But the end of it all, people won't notice because it creates this optical illusion. So here I'm going around here. And there. So I'll come back from this point to there. I'll finish there. So this one's a nice and easy one because I can just draw that line in. This one. I'm getting better at this now as, as I'm getting, getting the hang of drawing these lines. They close together to begin with and then get further apart. It's a little bit of practice. I've never done this before, by the way. I've never done this before, this paradox in this kind of shape. But you can see it works. It's just 
a bit more awkward with the curved shapes, but it's but it's not. It's exactly the same thing. You're just ordering the lines and allowing the gap between them to get wider from start to finish and try to control that width at the end so it's consistent. Um, I'm not very consistent at it, but I know that no matter what I do, this illusion will work. And I am turning my paper quite a lot. I'm trying to keep my hand out of the way for you. So I'm making myself quite dizzy here. So normally I would just I'm going to put a darkness there. So there's paradox. Sort of similar and sort of not. Yeah. They've got the same kind of feeling that we've got layers going down. This one's got a lot more layers than that one. In fact, I'm very tempted to fill all of that in in the middle. Okay, so I said that's very holly, these are very holly ball like, so let's do some holly ball. In this section, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give my flanks uh, a border like this. Some will be thinner than others. Some will get wider towards one end. And I'm fine with that, however they work out. We're doing some weaving of, of things here. So I'm going to put a plank in here as if it's coming behind this one. Like so. And then I'm going to put a plank from here across to there, put that double line in, and then I'm going to put this one in, like so. I can start to, um, let me see, how can I weave the next one? I think I want to go across here. so. Perhaps if I start from that end, that would make more sense because I'm I'm aiming for a wider point on the other side. So and they thought about briefly thought about where to start drawing this particular plank. I think this one will be quite a narrow one in comparison to the others. Because the narrowness of this area here. This is quite, this hasn't got much in it, so I'm going to put another plank in here and I think I'm going to start it here. Like so, and then I can do the other side like so. So it'd be hidden underneath here. I think I've got space here for another one, haven't I? So I'm going to go this way. And I am going to just aura on the outside of that line, as it were. And I can put the other side of this plank in, just like that. I think I can put just one more in here. Like so. Might be able to fit one in just in this corner as well. If I imagine that there's one coming from just this point here across. And we've got that one there. That fills that space quite nicely. And these areas here need something to fill them in. And this is where some of these patterns can come in, texture patterns can come in really useful. Um, we could do it in all kinds of ways. Because I've put the double border on, I'm much happier filling these areas straight away. 
and I'm going to keep it really really simple because I don't have a lot of spaces so I am going to do just some cross hatching. Cross hatching I'm doing vertical lines close together and then I'm going to go across them horizontally so I get something that looks like fabric I suppose. If I had a bit more space and longer lines I'd leave gaps in the lines so it looks a bit more like old burlap or hessian sackcloth something like that or cheesecloth but I'm not. I'm just going to do some of these I won't do it all because it does look a bit tedious but I will do though as I can zoom in for this I'm sure. Of course if I wanted to, you know I could fill some of these in with this, others, I, other gaps. As I go along, I could start to change pattern that I'm using. Even that little space there I filled in with cross hatching. And I am trying to keep my lines going, cross hatches going in the same direction, which is roughly from the top of the page to the bottom, you know, sort of in perpendicular, parallel to the sides of the page. It's, um, it's not essential, you can twist and turn them and if you make that a consistent thing that you do it looks deliberate so don't panic about it. Just take your time. I mean, I'm using the same width of pen here, if I had a finer colour, fine, they did finer version of this pen then I would perhaps use it for this because it would give well a different feeling and you would have um, perhaps either more dense lines or if you leave them about the same distance as these because the line the ink line won't be so thick it'll have that feeling of being more open but I really do want these quite dense to be honest but I want that darkness behind which of course I could have achieved just by colouring them in but I'm not a fan of colouring with fine liners I have to say and this is a very good exercise for pen work fine motor control you know, making sure you know giving your hand-eye coordination a bit of a workout and learning to you know control of the pen as you work And I find if I don't draw every day, if I go a couple of days without drawing, then my hand-eye coordination is not as good. And my fine motor control isn't as good when I return to drawing as I found out um, when I damaged my the, the muscle, you know, muscles, ligaments, tendons, whichever, between my shoulders and around a pair of ribs back in November. And I've still, I still get some soreness there and stiffness, um, you know, but it's taken what? November, December, January, February, March, April. Five months. I can't believe it was five months ago. It doesn't feel like that long ago. Blimey. And what's happened in that time? Oh, God. Fallen over, hurt my knee, twisted my ankle. I dislocated a toe a week ago. I managed to catch my little toe on, on a something under the bed and it's a little toe that I often do this to it's always my right foot and I can remember the first time I did this I was in primary school and I would have only been about six or seven I caught it on one of the benches that were in the hall um sort of like gym benches that we had there and I looked down and saw my toe was pointing at an odd angle so I'll just tap it back in which is what I did and it, it happens from time to time, you know, I catch my toe and it does, and I'm just like, whoop, it gets bruised, it's a bit sore, and it's fine. Because they can't do anything for toes anyway, if you break them, all they can do is tell you to wear, what's it? when I did break a toe, yeah, I broke a toe, I kicked one of my brothers, because he was annoying me, and I split one of my toe bones down the middle. And they said, there's nothing we can do, you're just going to have to wear shoes that support your toes it will take longer to heal but it will heal okay then and it did no problems you know I've had x-rays on my feet and ankles since then 
I can fall over my own shadow or over thin air. I really can, over sunshine. I always been clumsy, always had a poor balance. And um, I bounce, sort of. Well, I used to bounce really easily, as in not literally bounce, but I just get up, brush myself down. There might be a lot of swearing or a few tears and on I'd get with things. And um, if I was hurting, I knew I'd done some big damage, you know. Um, but the knee, my knee is, is healing, but oh, it itches terribly at the moment. Look at me moaning. But yeah, so, so I've done things like that. Oh, I've had the emotional mayhem, emotional and mental mayhem that went on. That's calming down. I've had problems with my digestive system. I think I may have got that kind of sorted now. Um, I've still got a lot of foods to work out what I can and what I can't eat, but that's okay, or how much I can eat of things. That's okay, it's a work in progress. And I kid you not, <laughs> so like I'm working out how stressed I get when I'm out by noise. I was with my older sister last week for brunch. And we were both there going, it's so noisy here, I can't I can't focus on what you're saying, I'm the same. And we couldn't we couldn't pick our own voices out from just the background noise and chatter and bangs and crashes. And we're so similar like that. And sort of like we're we're becoming more and more aware of it, I think, as we both spend a lot of time by ourselves and not in crowded places where there are lots of people. And um, you know, COVID has brought all of this up because during the pandemic, staying at home so much, which I still do generally, um, I, I I didn't have that constant level of being around people and the noise and the fuss and the, the nonsense, the games that people can play and so on. And going back out there, it's very stressful, I'm finding. You know, I like people, but in small doses and, and the fewer the better often. But you know, I've never been a party girl, so that's not a problem. And I'm not a pub and club kind of lass. So, you know, I've, I've gone on, I've witted, haven't I? How did I get to this? Fine motor control. And how, for a number of weeks, I couldn't do any drawing. I just couldn't. It was just too painful. I just to sit up, let alone draw. And um, eventually I got back into it. And... Um, yeah, so it's important that, you know, I try to draw every single day. Occasionally there's a day where I may not, but the next day I always make sure I do. Um, and it was the same when, I was, when I've been away for a couple of days, so on. I've always got a sketchbook with me, always take pens so I can, I can draw, and I usually carry it around with me so I can sit and draw at will, as it were. So there we are. Okay, so I've got a couple of more areas to do. And I think I'm going to split another one up into bands. I might do that one like that. I do like these curvy kinds of bands that we've got here. Let's have some that are a narrower kind of section. And perhaps some that go really crazy in shape. Now for this one, I am going to take these bands right up to the edge of that section so we can have a look at the difference it makes. Okay, so in one of these, I am going to do, and then I think in this one, I am going to fill this in with shapes, solid shapes that... Sort of connect or you know go beside one another so it's a different way of splitting this space off if you think about it it's a bit like this one but i'm coloring the, the shapes in instead of leaving them blank and open so you can see here what i'm doing i'm sorry if i was off screen when i drew the pencil lines but hopefully you can see them here now and because i'm adding colour to these, I can easily adjust the shape if I'm not very fussed on that shape. 
And they don't have to have straight edges, they can have curved edges like this one. And that one. Just try and keep the, the line in between fairly consistent, I think. That's not important, as you may think. Well, that is kind of an interesting shape, but it's not the kind of thing I really want. So I'm going to put that there. I'm going to put a curve on the other side. This really irritates me, colouring in your fine liners. I just think of it, colouring apart from digitally tends to irritate me anyway. But even digitally colouring things in can irritate me from time to time. Pull that in like that. I've just realised I said I was going to go right up to the edge and I didn't with this one. So let me go back and just fill that bit in. So it looks like these are tucked under, they're be behind a window. This one feels like they kind of fill the window, you know, sort of like they're floating in the window. That's quite nice. I like that. And this one, I'm going to do dots and join them with a line, but the line doesn't join the dot. You see what I mean? I actually don't have this one in my list. There's a couple here I don't have in my list, so I'm going to have to add them to my book. This happens, and new new ideas come as you draw. Well, I find they do. And uh, I may have I've used this before. Kind of like beads in this long stitch. Kind of. I think it's a pattern I've seen on shells or sea urchins, something like that, you know? Fossils, perhaps. So it reminds me of such things. There we go. So that's a different kind of edge and border. I like that one as well. Okay, what can we do next? Hmm. I'm going to do... Hmm. Look at Oaks. I'm looking. I'm looking here because, okay, I know what I'm going to do. This one Putting this up as if it's made from little blocks of stone. So it's all kinds of random shapes, but the trick is trying to get the spaces between them fairly even and not having too many things that are the same shape or same size, I suppose. There's going to be some awkward gaps here. This one, I could fill these in with colour, and I'm kind of tempted to, but I think for speed I'm just going to leave them as they are. And then I'm just going to round the inner corners again. Give that little bit of feeling of weight there or roundedness. Of course, you know, drawing these shapes with more rounded corners, as I tend to do, I don't always manage it exactly like here, but they can go back and give them that feeling of being rounded. And also that little bit of ink that adds that weight and seems to make them stick to the paper better, like nailing them to the paper with ink, without nails, just ink. I suppose that's more like glue. Feels deliberate and just 
if that's how it's meant to be. Now, the reverse of this is I could have, I could go back and actually I might do that, all things considered. I could leave it like that. What I can also do is I can complete the line underneath them and then go back and fill these spaces in between like mortar in a wall. So this looks more like a stone wall then. This one's got thick mortar. If you draw just the shapes in, I'll do this in a moment, I'll do this in another section. With lines, then you get a feeling of closely put together um, stones or bricks, you know, odd shaped bricks. It's fine. Find a lot of things like this, or you can do on things like um, keys for geological maps and so on, which is always fun. Okie doke, so I said I was going to do a different one, and I am. And again, I'm going to take a line, top and bottom, make sure I've got a nice separation. And then I'm going to start with drawing shapes that are quite angular. Like so. And I do just split them up and just let them do what they want to do. Eventually you get something that's a bit like crazy paving. Like this, and then we can go back and just add some ink to around the corners if we want to. I'm just going to do that on one edge you can see what it's like. It adds some interest there, I think. Okay, I will finish these two sections off. I'm just over an hour. So tempted to do the last two as well. Find something really quick and easy to fill those in with. Hmm, it's possible. Okay, what can we do here? Okay, this one I'm going to do something interesting with because I'm going to draw curved shapes like this. Now the other end would be beneath the this border, okay? So I'm curving the top of these lines mostly. shading will help to bring out some feeling of curvature with this. What I'm going to do is I am going to go back and I'm just going to add some ink to the left of each of these shapes. It will also help to add some volume. Shading will really help. And this last section up here, I'm going to fill that in this way. I'm going to draw strings of beads. They can be different sizes. You could do different shapes, different distributions of the beads as well. And this one up here is going to have one on it. I'm leaving little gaps between them but you could just put them all close together like that. Choice is yours. Or like me, you've used I've used a mixture of them so I can go back and add perhaps some between others. We'll vary the size of them so we've got a big one here and perhaps two small ones on either side. And that just fills that space quite nicely. In fact, I may just put another one in there and perhaps another one up there just to complete that space. This bottom one then forms that barrier between this section and that one. Just 
going back and just rounding some of these corners a little bit more, particularly the ends of the lines where they join edges, I think. It doesn't take too long. I'm not being too perfect about it. There we are. Mostly done. That one there. That one. I think that's mostly done now. There we go. So let's move let's move out. You can see how that looks. Now then. I've got two more spaces to fill, so I'm looking at fills that can be done quite quickly. And I want ones that are quite random, so I'm having a look through my pages here, which you can't see. I know, I think I know what I'm going to do in this one. I'm going to fill this with lots of circles, and I'm going to add ink. Um, left and bottom again, like so. The lines can go in any direction. I'm choosing to use lines to fill this in rather than ink because it makes things more interesting. Of course, you can make patterns with them as well. Curved lines, circles that tuck under. I'll make use of that and put the lines going this way. Just adding patterns in different ways to this. Um, if I do that to them all, or you know, not all of them, but every now and again add something else in, then it will look all kind of deliberate. But it's another way of trying out different patterns and seeing how it works. After all, this is really a sketchbook page, and it is you know, sketchbooks. Despite what you may see on YouTube, where people show you perfect sketchbooks, perfect pieces of work and finished pieces of work in their sketchbook. That's not really what a sketchbook is for. A sketchbook is for drawing, trying things out, practicing, making mistakes, learning from them, developing ideas, doing iterations, which is doing the same thing over and over and over again, slightly changing each time until you get what you are looking for. And they're not meant to be perfect. Now, says she who has sketchbooks that look perfect, but they are not. I can tell you that now. <laughs> My sketchbooks are not perfect. They seem to be, but they are mainly full of, you know, just drawings. Because to be honest with you, the way I draw is the way I sketch. Yeah, I know. But if I make a mistake in my sketchbook, I don't let it worry me because it is a sketchbook. But if it's a drawing I want to take further or I want to work on, then often I'll scan it in and work on it digitally these days. Sometimes not, but um, I prefer to work on things digitally because then I can explore without the fear of messing things up which I do in my sketchbook, knowing that I like to scan things in and work on them digitally so I can correct the errors or things I don't like when I redraw them that way, using my original drawing as a guide. So, you know, you have a sketchbook and you give yourself permission to make mistakes, to let things go wrong. And sometimes when things go wrong, where they don't work out 
the way you had hoped they would or with what you've got in mind. It might be a disappointment to you, but my advice is always to not give up, not beat yourself up, but put the sketchbook away for a few days and come back to it, have a look at what you've done and you may be surprised that you actually like what you've done. Or that you think, well, that bit was the bit that I don't like. But everything else I'll do, I'll give this another go and change that area. And sketchbooks are really useful as well. Warts and all. Because they become a record of your work and your development and your focus of attention when you're creating art, when you're drawing, painting, whatever else you do. And it's like a journal, it's a record, a personal record of progress being made. And when you, you know, don't look back at your sketchbook often, not until you've finished it, because then you'll be able to look back to where you started and see the progress you made. That is the true value of a sketchbook. They're places to experiment, to explore, to make mistakes, to try things again, to write notes about what you like and what you don't like, to write reminders like Angela why do you bother with water-based media I know still, still, I still don't know why but it's all part and parcel of learning and developing what you like about your art how you become comfortable with what you're doing how you discover what really brightens your mind, that makes you smile, even if it doesn't work out as you expect or what you had in mind, you're still happy with what you've done. I mean, this is nothing like I expected because basically I had no plan in mind for what I was going to do here at all. Seriously, I really, really didn't. So it's all been a bit of a surprise. You know, and I, I, I look on things as saying, well, it may not be perfect, but it's good enough. And if something is good enough, it's good enough. It may be your best at that moment, at this time, on this day. Another day, your best will be different. Or 10 minutes later, your best may be different. So it's looking at that work and going, yeah, it's good enough for now. That shows what I was like now. I'm going to make a note of that. Sticky notes are great for that. Post-it notes, you know. Pop them in. Write down what, what you were like on that day. Little notes to yourself. And then you can remove them if you wish later on. Or you can make them a permanent feature of your, your sketchbook. You can stick them in with glue. Or staple them in or, or whatever. Or number your pages in your sketchbook and keep a little notebook. So you can write about each drawing as you make it and what you like and what you don't like to reflect on things. I, I do do this in my own way. Um, my problem is I don't always think in words. And I've said this before, I started YouTube as a way of getting me to get my thoughts out of my head and into words. Because if I have to explain to somebody else, then things make more sense to me. as I can get stuck in my head way too much. Okay, so that one's, that one's quite fun. Fair play. Got a bad case of measles now. Okay, now the last one here, I'm going to do something that is kind of similar, but is going to be a bit more on the organised side. So I will zoom in and I will finish this now. I mean, I'm one hour, 14 minutes into it. What's another five, 10 minutes going to make? So I'm going to do a vertical row of squares. You know, they're not perfectly vertical in a straight line. And I'm not bothered by that. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to go across and I'm going to draw another series of squares. About the same 
size as the ones here and they may get closer together towards the top because that's what's going to happen here. Apparently that is what these squares want to do, they want to cutch up together. And who am I to stop squares cutching? Cutching is a Welsh word meaning hug and it's a proper hug. It's not one of these, you know, two second hugs. Hi, nice to see you. It's a proper rib hugging, you know, squeezing hug until you relax kind of thing. It's a proper cutch. So these obviously want to cutch up together in their own little peculiar way. Um, part of me thinks, Angela, you'll have been better off drawing a grid. Part of me's going, no, let's do it this way. You'll be fine. It's a filler pattern. And yeah, it is. It's just a filler pattern. So here yeah, I'm going to add the next row of squares. So, and um, it, you know, if you want to, if you feel more comfortable drawing the pencil grid, please do. And you draw square at each inter intersection of your grid. So we're going to have squares going down here, one here. So <laughs> that's my weird squared bit. I've got a big section here, which is I didn't take the orid line. In this section all the way up there because I knew it was going to be silly leaf in. So this is all, and I'll zoom out, oh I will if I can find the right button, drop it. This is the whole of this set, this page filled in. The only things I haven't done is the betweed and the crescent moon today and I did blather on for 10 minutes or more so it's taken me a little over an hour. Now this does need some shading and part of me is thinking this would be so much better if I did take it up to the edge. So that's something I may do off camera. Um, shading, I don't know what I'd do it with, that's the thing. I don't like graphite, but graphite could work quite nicely with this, even with brown. Um, coloured pencils could work quite nicely. Char um, Chalk pastels would, but let's have a look. I'm sure I've got some. I've got a graphite pencil there. I've got a torty on here. So let's have a look. So here with this one, I'm just going to start adding some graphite round here. I'm using a um, pit graphite matte pencil from Faber Castell. They they're not as shiny as the um, ordinary graphite pencils. They're, they're more matte. They do have some shine because you can't get away from that. As if they're made of graphite, they're going to shine. Pastel pencils don't shine because they're made, made from chalky stuff. And chalk doesn't shine. Saying. But here, I'm just going around the edge to begin with of this space. Because I want to intensify the idea that the holly bore is below the surface of this. And I've got a torty on here. It's got some green pastel on the end, but hey ho. So I'm just blending this into the paper. Like this 2B, I could do with one that is a little bit softer. But we'll, we'll work with it. The idea is. I always say that with, when it comes to graphite and shading, until you work out exactly how much you want, less is always better because you can add. It's not so easy to take it away once you've um, forced it or you know rubbed it into the paper with a, a tortillon or a paper stump or some other tool of choice. It is starting to give some shading there. I do need one that is darker and I know I've got a darker pencil here. I actually have, oh, threw something on the floor. I've actually got a Derwent Graphic 4B, and this is ordinary graphite. And 4B is quite soft, so it will put a, a lot of graphite down 
and these pencils tend to be blacker than the harder pencils. The softer the softer the pencil, the darker it is. Charcoal pencils, black charcoal, work well as well. That's incredibly intense black and it it blends out a lot. You only need a tiny bit of charcoal. It goes a long way. Depending on the paper you're using, of course. So with this, I just want to work this in and just blend it out that little bit more. Just to intensify the shadows around the edge. So I don't think I'm going to add any colour to these sections. I think I'm going to leave them as they are. Now this would look equally lovely, I think, in black or any other colour you choose to draw. I just wanted to see what I'm trying to work out whether I like drawing with coloured pencils, you know, adding coloured pens rather. OK, now we need to add shadow for the polybores. Thanks, here. So I'm putting shadow on either side of where they overlap. Because that would make some kind of sense. Some there, some there, some there. I think I've got them all, just that one there. Okay, these are the ones that we can rub in, spread out that little bit more. Just a little bit, you don't want to spread it too far because everything will end up looking grey. And that's not the point of this exercise, it's just helping to enhance the idea that these are sort of like stacked one behind another. That's all. So that works, I think. And the paper's quite light, so I'm not going to use um, a white pen of any kind. Let me just bring some of this shadowing out here on the edges. A little bit more, perhaps. Oh, I missed that one there. Just to. Oh. Put shadow on that one or that one, that's okay because that's enough left on this tortillon. Tortillon. So we bring that out. So that just helps that little bit more. So that works, possibly. Okay. Um, then this one. Again, I'm going to go round the edge. I'm just going to put a little bit round the edge. I'm not going to overwork it. In fact, I've just picked up the wrong pencil. I was going to use this 4B because it's so much softer and darker. It's done a lot more graphite with a very gentle, soft touch. And I don't want to drag this out too far. I do, I do want just shadow around the edges. The edges are casting a shadow down a hole, as it were, the edge of a hole. So I'm not trying not to get in the idea of having a light source with this. But again, I'm going to look where these overlap, are overlapping one another and just putting graphite where the overlaps are more than anything else. And it will work out. I'm going down layer by layer, round and round, merry-go-round. I'm going to put a lot in the middle because that's where I want it really dark, is down there. Not the best, the smallest tortillon here, as in size, it's quite a large one. But it'll do the job for me. I've got to put some graphite there and there, but it's okay because there's enough on this to add it. I'm going to just move this out a little bit in the corners as well, just to soften the that edge there. And then go all along there, there. It's 
So there's that one done. Oh, sorry, I was off the screen again. Jeez. So all I've done is put graphite where they overlap. Okay. This one is going to be a bit different because I'm going to put graphite on these kind of spokes where the paradox kind of spirals out like this. And I'm going to put more towards the centre than round the outside. So this feels that it's it really is sinking into some kind of a hole. And I may put just a little bit round the outside edges, but I'm not going to put much because I don't want to darken it all. I want to keep some areas that are quite light. Up into the corners would be fine and then just down a little bit. And that just helps there. I'm trying to keep this on the camera and I'm failing, sorry. You might be able to see how I've made the shadow darker the closer we go to the centre, just to give it that feeling that it's just, you know, um, disappearing into the distance. This one I'd do the same as that one, so as I was off camera, let's see if I can keep myself on the camera. So I'm going underneath every line, you know, and see what I mean by underneath every line, like this. There, there, and there. Then I'm going to go back and I'm going to see where these overlap, if I need to put any more colour in. And I do around the edge here. Because these are where things overlap. Here's an overlap as well. I missed that one. Got a hint of um, graphite outside the lines here. It'll be fine. So that'll be fine. I think I've got everywhere. Well, some like this. I need some at the top. at that and I will just do this here So again, that just helps to bring out the different layers. And in the centre, I do want to add quite a bit more graphite. I was using the wrong pencil again, so I'm using the darker graphite in the middle. I'm just blending it out that little bit more to get that darker and help to have that feeling of things sinking below. Okie dokes. Um, with the crescent moon, again, it's just going to be around the outside. Um, and I will add some right to the centre where we have that um, dark brown spot there. Just to darken that down a little bit more as well. So let's just bring that out. That's the outside, so it feels that this is um, stuck indoors, you know, going lower down. So I'm going to put lots of graphite at the base there. I'm just going to get out that little bit just to darken all of this up here. So like we've got it sinking away. Okay. All right, I am going, I did want to have a look at this one here. Because what I'm going to do with this one, I'm going to put graphite at one end, so 
of these. So the darker the area, the further away it will appear. And so I'm just going to encourage it to move into the paper and just allow it to blend outwards just a little just to give it a, a kind of gradient of shadow there. It's just a little bit of grey along the edge. So that helps to suggest we've got something that is um, folding bending. Here with these I'm just going to put some graphite at the bottom of each one. And I'm just going to use this again just to give me shadowy area towards the bottom of each of these shapes, but I'm leaving a lighter area at the top. So I suggest that there's some areas that are in some kind of shadow and other areas not. So that works nicely. For this one, I am going to put shadow the edge of the lines, not the dots, the lines. I was almost going to put a shadow in the centre here, through the centre of it, but I think this will work nicely. And I can add some white if I wish to along the middle. With this one, I would add shadow just to the sides of this. I'm going to add quite a lot of graphite there and then it's a case of blending it in and just pulling it up just that little bit keeping it really dark on the edge like that okay this one I'm going to do do the same I think it's makes sense in a weird and wonderful way to do so. So I will just add shadow there, put some along there. I haven't done anything around the edges of I really on this one. That one gives that feeling that we've got you know again something that's curved. And this one is an interesting one, and I just think that the best way to approach this may be just around the edges and perhaps inside that first one there. Let's see if we can get it feeling like it's pillowing upwards perhaps a little bit, or there's an interesting rock of some kind. So we've got those going on. Okay, this one I do want to complete these right to the edge, so I'm not going to do anything with that. This one, I'm going to put graphite at the base of each of these long stems. You see where? And um, I'm not going to do them all, I'll just do a couple of them, well a few of them which is likely to end up turning into them all because once you start it's just as easy to do them all as it is to just do a couple. Not forgetting these ones at the top, even though we can't see where they go. If we do these we can assume that they are going off the page as well. Try to keep in the space, Angela. Some rushing. I am aware how long this video is. It's a ma mega marathon. One here. Another one there. Another one there. I've got more. It doesn't take long to do these.
that little hint of graphite at the base this does help to give some dimension here I think you'll agree add shadow without darkening everything too much really so that's quite that's quite an interesting one and the betweed I did in the last video this one I think I would just go around the edges quite a lot on the right I think well, And we're putting that shadow in to allow this to feel that it, it is underneath here. And I am just going to blend this out just a little bit. that one done. This one I'm tempted to do just the same because um, there are ways we can bring some of the pattern out. But let me have a look at this first and just do this. We've got graphite around the edges just to give that feeling this is underneath our um, Bella on the top. And I apologise, I got the name of the person who did the step out of Bella wrong in the video. I thought it was Linda Farmer, CZT, but I saw her name on the page on her website, tanglepatterns.com, and thought it was her. I kicked myself when I realised it wasn't. But I did, I did put an apology in the description of that video. Okay, so what I'm going to try is to put some shadow lines in between these squares. I've just drawn my graphite out of the area, but I'm not going to, I can erase that later on. As far as I'm concerned, erasers are essential and not a thing to be ashamed of using. I can understand why Zentangle wants you not to use erasers. It's learning to be comfortable with what you do. But there are times when like this where we could use them. That actually is quite interesting. That gives a different kind of feeling again. For that, it brings some... It almost makes it twist up and down, almost. And um, I could put some shadow underneath these just to have them feeling like they're floating and casting a shadow perhaps, but it's not essential. The, la the only one I've got left to do, and I might as well do it, and I think I'm going to split this video into two parts, okay? Because we're on one hour 38 minutes. But then I guess people can stop and start, and I'm sure no, it will get uploaded. Okay, and I want to put some darkness where these sections are. So I'm just going to run graphite down there because I really didn't have enough on the tortillon. It always reminds me of tortoise. Yes, I'm rubbing the graphite in with a tortoise. Does the tortoise object? Don't know. It doesn't speak my language. It doesn't speak English. It speaks tortoisees. Okay, 
So this is me done for now. I do think I need highlights. I do want to finish that one before I tackle any of that. But of course, I've got these to finish. And don't they look like they're floating above everything? I do think I could go a bit darker on my shading. But I'll show you that when I've done it. Or I'll wait until after everything is done. So thank you for joining me. Thank you for persevering through a very long video. And I look forward to seeing you again soon. So until then, take care, look after yourselves, and above all else, find time to be creative and be gentle to yourself. Hurrah for now. Bye. Bye all.